On this stretch of land in North America, 250 years ago, a British army, outnumbered and in the heart of enemy territory, fought a battle that would change the history of the world. It was the 13th of September, 1759, and it was the Battle of Quebec. Now largely forgotten, this battle was once a story every school child would have known, a founding myth of the British Empire. Britain used its industrial strength and a scientific approach to fight a campaign unlike any that had gone before. It sent a fleet of nearly 200 ships, carrying 20,000 men on a treacherous mission through uncharted waters. This campaign would become a template for how Britain would go on to conquer vast areas of the world. And it led to the creation of modern America as we know it today. I've always been fascinated by the events of 1759. This was the moment when two great superpowers, Britain and France, fought an extraordinary campaign over the future of the American continent. At the centre of the conflict was the French city of Quebec in Canada. I'm half Canadian, and during my summer holidays in Canada, I used to hear stories of that battle, and of the daring exploits on the water and on the battlefield. I spent the last three years writing a book on the conflict and what I've realised is just how important and dramatic those events really were. 1759 really was such a significant year. It was a time when new British technology and industry combined with her financial might to create a new kind of warfare. This new way of fighting would enable Britain to amass the largest empire in the history of the world, with London at its very centre. It was a turning point in history not just for Britain, but for the entire world. But nowhere are the effects of that year more visible than in today's United States of America. Nowadays, we take it for granted that Americans speak English and not French. The special relationship may come and go, but the English influence is still strong in language, culture and the law. But it could have been very different. I'm in downtown Pittsburgh, and this is the spot where this city really began. There's an outline here of an 18th century fort, but it wasn't British, this was French. It was called Fort Duquesne. It was just one of many French forts that extended through a vast North American empire, from the Gulf of Mexico, thousands of miles that way, up to the Atlantic Ocean. I've got a contemporary map here which shows simply the scale of this empire. This was New France, which stretched right from the far south all the way up to the Great Lakes and beyond. It surrounded the British territory, which was restricted to a strip of land along the east coast. The rapidly expanding population of the British colonies in North America was desperate to expand west into the heart of the continent. But that, of course, was territory already claimed by the French. Conflict between New France and British America was inevitable. For some years, a state of Cold War had existed between the two powers. The wild area along the frontiers had become a no-man's land, patrolled by both British and French soldiers. But that uneasy peace was shattered by an event that occurred not far from Pittsburgh in a wood now called Jumanville Glen. At dawn on a day in late May 1754, a French force around 30 men were suddenly attacked by British troops that had taken positions on the high ground there and in the woods surrounding them. 
10 of the French troops were killed immediately and the other 20 were taken captive. This was an unprovoked attack. The two sides were not technically at war. The young man in command of the attacking force was a 22-year-old British officer who'd been born in the American colonies. His name was George Washington. Washington's action enraged the French and was the spark that would ignite the world's first truly global conflict. This was the Seven Years' War, a clash of superpowers over vast areas of the planet. France and Britain each had empires stretching across the world. They and their allies would end up fighting each other, not just in Europe, but also in Africa, India and the Far East, wherever the two sides had colonies. But some of the fiercest fighting was in the resource-rich Americas. The capital of the French Americas was Quebec. And from here, the French inflicted defeat after defeat on the British, most famously at Fort William Henry, the battle featured in Last of the Mohicans. But Britain did manage one success, albeit in the remote eastern extremity of the continent, today's Nova Scotia. This is Louisbourg, which is a powerful French fortress clinging to the eastern edge of North America. That's the Atlantic just there, and this is built on a rocky outcrop of barren land, always assaulted by wind and rain and banks of fog. But it was a very strategic point because it controlled access up there into New France. Louisbourg sits at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, a huge waterway that reaches deep into the continent and right through French territory. The British knew of its importance, and in 1758, they took it from the French in a six-week siege. It had been the Navy that had been decisive in the capture of Louisbourg. They had brought the British troops here and landed them and their supplies so they could begin the siege. But they'd also blockaded the harbour to stop any supplies or help reaching Louisbourg from France. And they'd also sailed up close to these walls and pounded them to dust with their massive broadsides of cannon. So, British planners and politicians thought that if the Navy had been so successful in 1758 in delivering Britain a great victory, perhaps they could do so again in 1759, this time by launching a bold operation aimed right at the heart of New France. The plan was to attack the capital of New France, the city of Quebec. This beautiful city, already 150 years old, was the spiritual and military centre of the French Americas. But Quebec is deep in the heart of French territory, protected by hundreds of miles of wilderness. Just getting to it seemed like an impossible task. So the British developed a plan based on its navy, an army of over 10,000 soldiers would board ships at Louisbourg. Then they'd sail up into the dangerous St. Lawrence River, through enemy territory, right to the walls of Quebec. Such a plan would be difficult, dangerous, and very expensive. To command the British army on this expedition, the government made a surprising choice. They appointed a young man who'd shown his zeal and flair the year before during the fighting here at Louisbourg. His name was James Wolfe. He was 32 years old, and he'd never commanded an army before. He certainly didn't look like a hero. I've got a portrait of him here. He was very tall, gangly, apparently very chinless as well. But he didn't lack physical courage. He was always in the thick of the fighting. He did, however, have a very weak constitution. His diary is full of complaints about his ill health, and sea travel made him violently ill. He was, perhaps, a surprising choice for what would be a gruelling expedition hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the nearest friendly base. Wolfe was part of a new breed of highly professional British officer who emphasised careful preparation in every detail of combat. And nothing was more important than the health of his men. One of the biggest threats to his force was scurvy, but luckily, against that, 
He had a secret weapon. There may not be much fresh fruit in Nova Scotia, but there is plenty of spruce pine. Pinewood contains vitamin C, which keeps scurvy away. And the British had discovered a way of making it into beer. To find out what spruce beer tastes like, I've come to visit a local home brew enthusiast who's made a batch based on an authentic 18th century recipe. Well, what it said in uh, the recipe was a pound and a half of uh, good spruce, it says. So I cut it up small enough to go in this pot and then we have to boil it until the bark peels off. That's a nice smell. I love the old spruce smell. You can't beat it. Okay, so this is spruce beer that you've already brewed. Right, time to taste it? It's time. Cheers. Cheers. I'm nervous. <coughs> I can certainly taste the spruce. Yeah, but <laughs> it's pretty disgusting. Though. That's pretty gross. You'd have to be very sick to drink this stuff. Oh my God. I don't know how to describe it. It's just totally disgusting. That is one awful beer. <laughs> <laughs> At Louisburg, this beer would have been produced on an industrial scale, all part of the meticulous scientific approach to warfare that the British were pioneering. But Wolf faced a danger even greater than scurvy, time. He had just a few months to get to Quebec and defeat the French before the bitter winter arrived and the St. Lawrence turned to impenetrable ice. At the beginning of June 1759, Wolfe decides to leave and the British Admiral flies his flag at the main topmast and slowly over a hundred ships began to try and sail out of the harbour. The weather was pretty fair when they set off but of course before all these ships could leave the harbour it actually changed. Some, some cloud came in like today in the rain which meant lots of the ships had to re-anchor, wait for the wet wind to change and that would have taken a few days. So everything was going at a glacial pace and Wolf was getting increasingly impatient. Over a few days, this harbour would slowly have emptied of all its ships as they headed towards Quebec. Wolf was so keen to get underway that he'd left before the entire force was assembled and he'd actually left instructions here telling any stragglers to meet him at Quebec. Within days, the fleet had entered the mighty St. Lawrence. You can see just what a huge stretch of water this is, one of the great rivers of the world. This was such an extraordinary logistical achievement, really one that was unmatched at that point in British history. Nearly 200 ships had been assembled throughout the British Isles and also the British colonies in North America, and in them was every bag of flour, every nail, every cannonball that the expedition would need. They carried 163 pieces of siege artillery, uh, cattle, spades, 1.2 million musket cartridges, and uh, what, nearly 11,000 big barrels of gunpowder. It is like picking up a city and moving it a thousand miles. Before Wolf faced the enemy, he would have to make a long and treacherous journey. The St. Lawrence River is one of the most difficult stretches of water in the world. Even experienced French sailors struggled to bring ships up the river, and there were no charts to guide them. I'm ready. Ready about? Yep, ready. Okay. Here we go. To find out just how challenging this river is, I went out with a local sailor who knows the area well. <sighs> Around here, we're in the middle channel right on the St. Lawrence, and it's, it's got a terrible reputation. It's, surround, it's just lined with rocks and reefs and everything else. I can see, yeah, you can just see these little ridges of rock here. They're just going to rip the bottom out of your boat oh. if you get it wrong, eh? 
uh, exactly. And we're in 52 feet of water right now, but uh, shortly we'll be in zero feet of water. <laughs> we'll try to be careful. Well, it's, it's not an easy river to sail on this, is it? It's not an easy river. You have the current changes direction every six hours. So sure. I guess that's the tide kind of crashing in and crashing out every six hours. It's a huge body of water just moving up and down, I guess, eh? This is one of the biggest or largest rivers in the world. So you spent your entire life sailing here and it still, it still sounds like it's challenging enough. I mean, those, those Brits came up here in 1759, not one of them had ever sailed up this uh, river before. Well, they must have been half crazy. <laughs> Wolf was undeterred. He had some of the world's best sailors to guide him. Amongst them, a young James Cook, who would go on to become the famous explorer of the Pacific, Captain Cook. Okay. Cook set out to systematically map the river, using a simple but effective piece of technology to measure the depth, a sounding line. Seven fathoms, 42 feet deep. There you go. In this hole, they'd put wax, yeah. so they could tell if there was sand or mud or rock or whatever, yeah. and uh, that's how they knew uh, where they could put the hook down. So it's a pretty primitive bit of technology, but it tells you the depth, and it tells you sure. what the seabed is like. Exactly. So Not too get, bad. You get uh, two for one. <laughs> when men like James Cook had done enough of those soundings, they were able to put them together and compile an accurate picture of what they thought the navigation of the St. Lawrence looked like. And this is James Cook's chart of the St. Lawrence, which incredibly is the first time anyone had attempted to chart this river, French or British. It is still scarily accurate, and you can see just how tricky the navigation is, how important to get right. And this is so much more than a chart. This is a vital piece of evidence. If you're wondering how Britain went to be a mighty world empire, this is the answer. It's not because her sailors were tougher and her ships were better than her enemies, it's because they were more methodical and more scientific. Thanks to this scientific approach, the British had achieved something extraordinary. They had brought their entire fleet all the way up the St. Lawrence and right to the walls of Quebec without the loss of a single ship. The French couldn't believe their eyes. They had thought it quite impossible that the British ships would make it this far. The British celebrated, reveling in the achievement of their sailors and navigators. Well, they all did except one man. When Wolfe finally laid eyes on Quebec, he realized the true magnitude of the task that still faced him. Wolfe was so dispirited because he was seeing for the first time the imposing cliffs of Quebec. But you get an even better understanding of what he was up against from the air. You get the clearest possible view up here of the importance of Quebec. No matter how many times you see it on a map, it just, nothing compares to being up there and seeing it for yourself. And Quebec, the river narrows down to a, a gap just under a mile wide. And in fact, the Native American word Quebec means the Narrows. And that's why this settlement is here, because you can control all the ships going in and out of the St. Lawrence. There's only one way to approach Quebec, and that's from its westward side down there, where it's relatively flat on the Plains of Abraham. But all the other sides are surrounded by cliffs. And these acted like a strong fortress wall. Any attacker had to find a way up, and they're very easy to defend. They've got to have the strongest natural defences of any city in North America. As well as its superb position, Quebec also had impressive man-made defences. On the only side of Quebec, not surrounded by cliffs and rivers, the French had built this wall. One other thing Quebec had 
was plenty of defenders. There was a core group of around two or three thousand professional soldiers. But then a huge number of militiamen turned up, normal Canadians from all over the colony who rallied round to protect the capital city. There were boys as young as 14 and old men. Anyone who could shoulder a musket rushed here to Quebec to fight for their way of life. In charge of this force was Louis-Joseph, Marquis de Montcalm. Given that he was now charged with the defence of Canada, it's ironic that he absolutely hated the place. His letters home to his wife are full of his homesickness for his family and his house in the south of France. He's constantly inquiring after the health of his beloved daughters. He only took the job to ensure his family fortune and a sense of duty as a French nobleman. Montcalm had hoped that the treacherous waters of the St Lawrence River would stop the British expedition before it ever arrived here at Quebec. But, like all good generals, he'd prepared for the worst. For a month before the British were sighted off Quebec, this area had rung with shovels and pickaxes as thousands of people augmented the defences here, placing new cannons, building barricades and trenches. This is one of the most important features of the French defence the Royal Battery. Here there were cannon facing out towards the St Lawrence, able to fire at any ships that attempted to sail through the Narrows. This was a key part of the French plan, preventing the British from reaching the upper part of the river. So instead Wolfe's plan had been to attack this flat area east of Quebec, the Beauport shore. But Montcalm had thought of that as well, and he stationed over 10,000 soldiers on this coast. Wolfe knew that it would be madness to try and force his way onto the well-defended shores of the St Lawrence near Quebec. So the closest he could get where there were no French troops was here, on the east side of the magnificent Montmorency waterfalls. They're one of the natural wonders of this region. And now the British army on this side looked across at the French defenders on the other. And what's so exciting about being in this exact point is one of the famous paintings made of the Quebec campaign by Wolfe's assistant, his aide de camp, called Harvey Smith. And he paints this picture here. And it really is very resonant today. Very little has changed. You see the falls here, steeply wooded slopes stretching off down there. And then obviously the St. Lawrence River there with its British ships. And in the distance, you can see Quebec. The British had made it onto French soil, but they were still miles from Quebec with the waterfall and a powerful French force in the way. So they made this spot, just above the waterfall, their camp. In a matter of days, they had to create a secure base for thousands of men deep in hostile territory. Wolfe turned this camp on the edge of the Montmorency River into a fortress. He built no less than 11 of these redoubts. It would have been entrenched like this. On top of here, there would have been a stockade of logs with loopholes cut so you could shoot muskets through them, all designed to withstand enemy attack. Behind these redoubts and strong points is where the men slept in neat rows of tents. The tents of the British Army were always laid out on the same pattern, no matter where they were, from Salisbury Plain to the wilds of Canada, to try and give the men a sense of familiarity, a sense of a home from a home. Another key part of the new British approach was an obsession with training. Every day, the soldiers would have spent hours being drilled in musket firing. My platoon, load. The aim of the drill was to turn ordinary men into efficient fighting machines. To find out just what it involves, I joined a group of 18th century reenactors. We'll start off first with some basic postures. So, eyes front. If the officer says, order your fire lock. Order your fire lock, okay. You'll have your fire on this side. Your hand will be there. Now the next one is rest. Now if you bring this hand Being a British soldier meant learning a sequence of positions, which you had to be able to copy down to every detail. Next posture, the okay. elbow square. It's harder than it sounds. Shoulder your fire lock. And... Uh, 
there you've managed to reverse your fire lock. It's a novel uh, interpretation of the drill. The full right? musket okay. drill had more than 20 of these positions. I was doing a simplified version with just four. No, I, don't, I don't feel like a well-oiled military machine here. Right, recover. Okay. Uh, recover, <laughs> which one's recover? <laughs> okay, uh, that one's rest. Yes. So which one's recover? We've only done three things so far. I know. Two out of three is bad. <laughs> so, what's that one? That's order. That's order. That's shoulder. Yep. And that's rest. Yep. So which is, which is recover? It's the other one. I can't remember the other one. Right. You're going, you're... By learning a series of exact positions, all the soldiers in a group will be synchronised and able to maintain a rapid rate of fire, even in the heat of battle. I'm OK! Yeah, well, yeah. that's the theory. Shoulder your fire locks! Recover your fire locks! Prime and load! If the men get out of sync, a soldier could easily end up shooting the person in front. So a unit has to wait for its slowest member. Unfortunately, that was me. Never mind. It's all right. Mike, ready! Present! Fire! I don't feel like a soldier. I think I'm a pretty long way from being a proper 18th century infantryman. The British had done everything they could to prepare their men for fighting on the open field of battle. But what they hadn't counted on was that they now had to fight a very different kind of enemy. For thousands of years before any Europeans arrived, these lands had been inhabited by Native American tribes. Many of them had managed to reach a peaceful coexistence with the French, but they feared that the British would force them off the land. And so they allied themselves with the French and launched an effective guerrilla campaign against the invaders. The British at this camp in particular felt isolated. They felt surrounded by an unseen enemy. Uh, all too often they'd leave sentries out at night and in the morning they'd discover their horribly mutilated corpses. Around about this time of day, at sunset, uh, everyone in the camp had to stand to arms to be ready to repel an attack. The problem for the British was that they were fighting in a landscape that was totally alien to them against an enemy for whom this was home. André Borbou knows more than most about this environment and what it takes to survive in it. So André, didn't you spend a month in the wilderness with some credit cards and a car key? Yeah, it was a, one of those crazy things to do when you're young, you know, an adventure. <laughs> But yeah, 31 days with uh, no gear, no food, no, no fire, no matches, no, no knife, uh, nothing at all. Just, just the clothes on my back. And did that give you an insight into just how, uh, how difficult it is to survive in these conditions? It gave me a great big deal of, uh, of respect for our, our forefathers. It's just uh, unbelievable how tough you have to be to do these, these, these things. So in the, in, the, uh, in the fighting 250 years ago, uh, what advantages did the Native Americans have over these British coming in? Well, they just had thousands of years of experience, you know. Um, I've been researching wilderness survival the last 30 years, and I, uh, I swear I'm a, a rank beginner compared to these guys that did it day in and day out, every single day. They were tough, they knew everything. So when the French Canadians came in, they, they kind of learned from the Indians how to do it. They'd learn how to make the fires, how to, what kind of shelters, what kind of materials you use to build your shelters and all this from the native people. It's interesting because these redcoats, these British soldiers that arrived here in North America, they spent their whole careers training for a different kind of warfare. Yeah. 
you know, standing in lines on big open fields mm -hmm. shooting muskets. And here they are. I mean, I guess they have to learn a, well, a, a completely new way of fighting. Yeah, they, they can't win against against somebody that knows the force because uh, that knows the force is is gonna they're gonna be completely camouflaged. You can't see a guy in the forest if he's camouflaged. How about I mean, if he's wearing a bright red coat? Well, <laughs> you know, they stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> Techniques like camouflage, ambush, and even building traps gave the Native Americans and their French allies a huge advantage over the British. That's a lot of kick. <laughs> So I guess the thing that people have always read about this, this war and this, these conditions is tracking, how the Native Americans are amazing trackers. Are you, are you an expert at that? Oh, not, not a great expert, but uh, I can follow you, that's for sure. I'm actually very, very light-footed, I've got to tell you. Yeah? <laughs> mm. Even from this far away, you can see that hole where you stepped on. Okay, wait, wait, let me come back and you can show me. Okay. So you, you kind of stepped in here and, and ripped that moss off of this one. Okay. And then as you walk in here, you know, you kind of stumbled on this one and, and yeah. kicked right into it and made a big hole. Here. That is pretty obvious, I have to say. Th that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Okay, Andre, I take your point. So are there ways to minimize your tracks? Well, the, the first thing you're going to do is wear moccasins. You know, look, look how f flat they are and there's, there's no, no grips. And then as, as you walk, you just, you just watch every single step. See how your, your foot kind of breaks that? With moccasins, your, your ankles bend. And with boots, your ankles don't bend. So then everything gets cut. I suppose eventually, if you, if you do this enough, it becomes second nature. You could virtually run through this forest w without leaving all these signs. Oh, Indian, Indian folk would be able to do that. The British were trapped. French cannon protected the narrows. Thousands of French troops were defending the shore. And in the wilderness, the British were at the mercy of the Native Americans. So they took revenge on the Canadian inhabitants of the countryside. For miles around, the British burnt farms and destroyed houses. This is the remains of a church which the British attacked, killing those who'd been sheltering inside. Just one of many atrocities committed that summer. There was particular animosity to this campaign. Wolfe himself wrote the year before that it would be a pleasure to see the Canadian vermin sacked and pillaged and justly repaid of this unheard of cruelty. But the interesting thing about the British Army is they didn't all agree with that. One of Wolfe's brigadiers, the rank below him, a man called Townsend, uh, said, I never served in so disagreeable a campaign as this. It's a scene of skirmishing, cruelty and devastation. It is war of the worst shape, a scene I ought not to be in. The inhabitants of Quebec weren't safe either. The British had taken Point Levy on the other side of the Narrows. Today, just a short ferry ride away from Quebec. And from here, they used another weapon shipped all the way from Britain, artillery. At 9pm, as the light was falling on the 12th of July, 1759, a firework blasted up from here, and that was the sign for the artillery bombardment to begin. At each of the cannon, a blue-coated artillery sergeant marched up, lit the gunpowder, and cannonballs were sent flying towards the town. Now initially, because the barrels were cold, the British cannonballs were falling short. They weren't reaching the town, they were dropping into the St. Lawrence. And the British soldiers up here could hear the shouts and jeers of the French defenders. But the British cranked up the elevation to the maximum, about 45 degrees, and as the barrels heated up, the cannonballs started to hit home. Not just cannonballs, but explosive mortar rounds, and even things called carcasses, which were big, flaming incendiary bombs, which left the trail like a comet as they arched through the sky. The governor of Quebec estimated that 200 of those incendiary bombs hit Quebec on that first night.
For weeks to come, the British bombarded Quebec mercilessly. As this British map shows, their artillery was able to reach right into the city. No part of the town was completely safe. This square, the Place Royale, the lower town, was particularly badly hit. There's a contemporary drawing here which shows the damage. It's absolutely extraordinary. There's not a single house that isn't totally destroyed here. The church in the middle burnt out. There was hardly a building left standing in Quebec. If they hadn't been destroyed by cannonballs, they'd been consumed by fire started by the carcasses. But the people of Quebec were still determined to resist. This enormous use of force against the civilian population of Quebec, so reminiscent of the uh, strategic bombing campaigns of the 20th century, wasn't bringing Wolf any closer to capturing this town. It was just causing utter misery for the inhabitants. The main British force were still stuck on the far side of the Montmorency River, looking across at its enemy. With winter approaching, Wolf couldn't risk waiting any longer. He decided to launch an attack aimed at the French defences on the other side of the waterfall. The British were attempting a new kind of amphibious attack. Flat-bottomed boats, being used in combat for the first time, would land the men onto this shore. Then the troops would storm across this narrow strip of land, attacking the French at the base of the cliff. But they would be running the risk of facing heavy fire from the French troops at the top of the cliff. Wolf's plan was to send his men ashore here. Now, the trouble was, they got the tides badly wrong. As you can see, see, I've never been down here before, but you see all these sandbanks emerge from the St. Lawrence. You realize just how shallow it is. As the boats came in, they hit these sandbanks and the men had to jump out and try and haul them over and work out a sort of passage through to the shore here, and that took hours. The big problem with that, of course, also, is that the French got the perfect idea about where the British were planning to attack. So they spent the whole afternoon rushing reinforcements into their entrenchments and their redoubts up there. General Wolfe, worth mentioning, was in the thick of the action. He was hit by three splinters as French cannonballs crashed into the ship. He even had his cane knocked out of his hand, apparently. To finally negotiating these obstacles and getting their boats quite near the shore, the British soldiers jumped out onto this beach, and one British sergeant has left this account. He says that the beach was covered with slimy mud, exceeding slippery and broken into deep holes. And that's recognisably this beach. But once Wolfe's men had got to shore, something absolutely remarkable happened. Rather than listening to their officers and falling into neat ranks, ready for the next phase of the assault, the band played the Grenadiers' March, and with that, the men took off in a wild, mad charge. Although extremely brave, this attack was foolhardy. Wolf couldn't believe his eyes. He later called it unsoldierlike, irregular and impetuous, but you couldn't fault him for trying. And the French couldn't believe their luck. They were just sitting in their trenches, firing their muskets down onto these grenadiers. They poured their small shot like showers of hail, which caused our brave grenadiers to fall very fast. And from here on the beach, for a couple of hundred metres, the ground was soon thick with casualties. Suddenly, the rain poured from the heavens. One officer wrote, the violence of the storm exceeded any description I can give of it. All of the men's powder was absolutely soaked. The British grenadiers tramped back down to this beach. They looked behind them, they saw this field of dead and wounded grenadiers was now the target of whooping bands of Native Americans and Canadians who left the trenches up on the hill and ran down to mutilate and kill those they'd left behind. One sergeant said that the men were filled with horror at the barbarous cruelty of the savages committed on their brother soldiers. Poor planning and a breakdown of discipline had brought humiliating defeat, and worse was to come. After defeat at the battle on the other side of the Montmorency Falls came disease. Typhus and dysentery tore 
through the British Army and eventually Wolfe himself also fell sick. Now he received a lot better treatment than most of his men. He was able to commandeer this house, it still survives amazingly, surrounded by modern suburbia, where he was able to recuperate up there in the attic. But for several days it looked like he might not make it and his army were gravely concerned. Then he writes an extraordinary letter to his mother and he says he has nothing to report but defeat and disappointment. And then he finishes with an extraordinary admission. He says, I have launched a plan of quitting the service, which I am determined to do at the first opportunity. Wolfe was convinced that the failure to defeat the French was his responsibility, and his officers agreed. One wrote, General Wolfe's health is very bad. His generalship is, in my opinion, not a bit better. They were frustrated with Wolfe's obsession with attacking the well-defended Beauport shore. They thought they had a better idea. They wanted to attack Quebec from the other side, here on the Plains of Abraham at the top of the steep cliffs. But landing troops here would mean getting their ships past the French defences. No easy task. In order for the British ships to get past the narrows here and past the gun batteries in Quebec, they had to wait for the sun to go down and the tide had to be perfect, it had to be steaming in at full speed and the wind had to be from blowing over my shoulder. Everything had to be exactly right. That meant the ships could get up some speed and shoot the narrows before the French had time really to unleash their cannon batteries in full force on them. Thanks to the skill and bravery of the British sailors, the Navy succeeded in getting a large number of ships through the Narrows with only minor damage from the French guns. Wolfe finally recovered and took command. By now, winter was fast approaching, so he reluctantly went along with his officers' plan. He ordered his troops to get ready for one last attack. Once again, it would be an amphibious assault. It would need the perfect integration of the army and navy, and this time they would attempt to land in a secret night attack. Their landing point was by a ravine where a rough track led up the cliffs, called the Anse aux Foulons. In the early hours of September the 13th, 1759, Wolfe's first wave landed here, quite near the Anse aux Foulons. Conditions were as they are tonight, still and clear, the perfect conditions for amphibious landing. The landing spot today is a working port, a reminder that history can be found in industrial parks, not just national parks. Well, this is certainly one obstruction that the British troops didn't have to put up with. Anso Foulon is just over there. They've built a modern road up the ravine where the old track used to be. But we're told that the first wave of Wolf's army actually landed a little bit further downstream, somewhere around about here, and they were forced to climb up a section of cliff without any track up it at all. So these British troops knew they had to get to the top to clear away the French defenders so the rest of the British force could land. Everything depended on these guys getting up this slope as quickly as possible. It's actually brilliant, this, because it tallies with the uh, accounts written on the, on the day itself, which says they used to, they were grabbing onto roots and bushes and they went up, and actually there's nothing else here at all to hold on to. Uh, this soil is particularly difficult to get a grip on, it just comes away under your feet. <sighs> You can see why this climb became one of the legends of British military history. Schoolboys into the 20th century were taught about this and they came to symbolise everything that the British liked to think of themselves as. It was brave soldiers overcoming the odds against nature, against their enemy, toughing it out to achieve final victory. They arrived here at the top and found themselves near the top of the track which led up from the Elster Foulon, 
where this modern road now runs. Fortunately, they'd ended up just behind a French camp that was guarding the track. The soldiers there were taken completely by surprise. The French now had no stomach for that fight, and they fled. The road from Anse Foulon to the Heights of Abraham now lay open. Well, I've just climbed the cliffs up here to the rolling plains of Abraham, and it's about 6 a.m. on a September morning, and the sun is just peeking up above the uh, fortress of Quebec there, and really around about the same time that Wolf would have made that climb, and it's incredible being up here now. The, the, there's a golden glow on all the trees. It's really quite magical. By sunrise, over 4,000 British troops had made it up the steep track and onto the plains, hauling two cannon with them. From the accounts, it seems that the soldiers were invigorated by this climb and this sharp fight that had occurred at the top. But now there was a time for contemplation. The landings had been successful, but there was also a sense of foreboding because they knew that what came next had to be a battle. French sentries could now see the British and delivered the shocking news to their commander, Montcalm. He knew that if the British could dig in on the plains and lay siege, the walls of Quebec would soon fall. So he made the decision to go out and fight. And what's true of all amphibious landings, you think particularly about D-Day, for example, is that they're most vulnerable in the minutes and hours after they first occur. That's the best chance that defenders have of rushing onto the beach and throwing the attackers back into the water. The British now readied themselves. This was what they'd been waiting for, a chance to put all their training into action on the open field of battle. But as they reached this point here, approximately about half a mile away from the walls of Quebec, they saw the French army streaming out of the gates. One British soldier said they were like bees coming out of a hive. This is approximately where the British line would have been, starting down there next to the cliffs by the river and then stretching in a long line this way for about half a mile, about three feet between each of the soldiers. And usually the British army had lined up three deep, but some young officers like Wolfe insisted that two ranks would be enough. So really this period sees the birth of what we now call the thin red line. In the front rank were the tallest men. One, one drill manual says the most well-made men to intimidate the enemy as they charged towards them. They were told to stand bolt upright, chests out, eyes forward, and in dead silence, waiting for the commands of their officers and waiting for the enemy. Meanwhile, the French had formed up a rough and ready line over there, but whereas the British stood still waiting, the French couldn't wait and they charged. But it wasn't an orderly advance. There was some confusion. There was shouting and running. There were calls of Vive la Roi, which is long live the king. And they sort of hurtled towards the British line. Now, the British unleashed their first deadly weapon. The British cannon switched to firing what they call canister, which are boxes with 400 musket balls in that explode when they come out of the cannon and turn them into some sort of giant shotguns. And these cut down swathes of French. The French firing was pretty wild anyway because they were running along and firing as they went, so most of their shots were missing. As the French charged towards them, the British stood still and ready. This was the moment that these British troops lined up in their ranks had been training for, not just for the summer, but for their entire careers. Hour upon hour of musket drills. When the French were 50 or 60 meters out, the command came to present, and a thousand muskets were raised and pointed at the enemy. They aimed typically for the French ankles, knowing that the muskets tended to fire high. Then, when the French were 40 meters away, when the officers could see the whites of their eyes, came the command, fire.
The effect of that musket volley was shattering. Many of the British muskets were loaded with two balls, and as a result, thousands of musket balls traveling at 500 feet per second crashed into the French ranks. Ah! French charge came to a halt. Many of their officers and their leaders were wiped out. Then, just 20 seconds later, the British had reloaded and fired another volley, and then again and again. For five or six minutes, the French stood in utter confusion, their sight completely obscured by huge clouds of musket smoke, the noise of the volleys deafening them, the smell of all the gunpowder was apparently nauseous. The French officers that remained said they'd never experienced anything like it. The British strategy was all about the musket and how to use it to maximum effectiveness. To see a musket in action, I've come to meet battlefield archaeologist Tony Pollard. We've got a, a, a row of soldiers at about 70 yards up at the top of the hill. That represents the distance, roughly, that the French opened fire at. So it's, it's quite a long range, as you can see. And uh, first off, we'll have a crack at those okay, on the top of the hill. Okay, go for it. Well, I saw a lot of mud. I think I hit those rocks at the back. I think you might have done them. Wow. Well, let's try another one, see if, you, uh, see if you get any luckier. Okay. At 70 yards, Tony was having real difficulty oh. hitting the targets. That was low. Just to the left, wasn't it, I think, that one? The British, however, right. waited until the French were much closer, as little as 30 yards. It's amazing, no matter how many times you read about it or write about it, Actually, seeing it here in this field, 30 yards is so close. And you're talking about thousands of men coming at you as a solid mass. It would have taken nerves of steel, really. Whoa! Now, this is where it gets a little different. Ah! They were double-shotting. They were using two musket yep. balls for every gun. As you can see, that's, that's lead, and when that hits something hard, it just spreads out dreadfully. It's a horrible weapon. OK, now, I suggest you step well back yeah. this baby. Oh. oh! Well, you can see a lot of splintering around here. Yeah, this has caused some real damage. Oh. So I think that's a pair there. Gosh, so they do, they do spread a fair bit, yeah. don't they? This chap, he's gone right through, through there. And the thing is that at this range, they probably would have passed straight the way through the human body unless it hit something hard like the musket or maybe bone. But it's, it's highly likely the musket ball would have travelled, we've, we've replicated that in the past, would have travelled directly through the body and may, may even Im impacted on the guy behind him. Wow. It's horrific, Just really, isn't it? Devastating physically and psychologically. Yeah. Sure enough, the French couldn't withstand the British musket fire. They turned and fled, leaving behind them hundreds of dead and wounded comrades. Britain had its victory. Months of preparation, a journey of a thousand miles, and a summer of stalemate had climaxed in a battle lasting less than half an hour. It had been Wolfe's victory, but he didn't live long enough to enjoy the spoils. As always, he'd been in the thick of the fighting. He'd been wounded more than once. The final time came when a musket ball crashed into his chest. He was helped back from the front line to this very spot where he collapsed. He lived just long enough to hear that the French were fleeing. Then he said, now God be praised, I can die in peace. Wolfe was now a national hero, and a painting of his death would immortalize him, becoming the single most reproduced image of the 18th century. And this is it, the death of General Wolfe by the young American artist, Benjamin West. It's self-consciously epic, Wolf lies in the middle, mortally wounded, like the hero in some classical myth. The Union flag here draped over his shoulders whilst the great and good from his army look around in dismay, and at this Native American, like a noble savage, looks on at his beloved commander. Now, all of this, of course, is totally untrue. None of the great and good of his army were standing around like this, and of course, there were no Native Americans present. He absolutely hated them. But of course, what West is doing here is not about an accurate depiction of his death, it's about creating a myth. Wolfe is portrayed as Britain's first imperial martyr, dying so that the new British Empire 
may live. But Wolf wasn't the only commander to suffer a fatal injury that day. Montcalm was shot as he fled and died the next morning. He is now buried in this graveyard. With the French general dead, Quebec surrendered. After a bloody summer for the British, only 50 of their men had been killed in the decisive battle. But for the survivors, the greatest challenge was yet to come. Winter proved to be a deadlier foe even than the French. The temperatures plummeted to minus 30. The countryside froze, as did the River St. Lawrence. There was no chance of getting fresh supplies into the beleaguered British garrison of Quebec. The town itself was shattered. The buildings provided no protection from the elements at all. The British died in their hundreds of scurvy and exposure. The ground was too hard to dig graves, and so British corpses were piled up, frozen like logs outside the city walls. At least their sacrifice was not in vain. Quebec was now part of the British Empire, though it was allowed to keep its French language and culture. This victory helped turn the tide of the Seven Years' War in Britain's favour. In 1763, France finally admitted defeat, and it ceded the whole of Canada and the American Midwest to Britain. It was the end of New France. Victory at Quebec showed how Britain's industrial might, its powerful navy, and a rigorous scientific approach to warfare could make it unbeatable. Britain was now the world's dominant superpower and had taken control over what would become the richest continent on Earth. But the British didn't have long to enjoy the fruits of their victory. They'd finished the war victorious, but terribly in debt. Now, the British government's plan was to raise a bit of money by taxing the American colonists. But the Americans realised that now the threat of the French had gone, they didn't need British protection at all. Unless the generation after Quebec, America rose up in rebellion against the British crown. And who's the man that the Americans turned to to lead them in this struggle? Well, the man that had started the Seven Years' War, George Washington. As the Washington Monument celebrates, he inflicted a humiliating defeat on the British and created the United States of America as a nation free of Britain's empire. But thanks in large part to Wolfe's victory, North America is primarily English, not French speaking. And to this day, the USA's law, culture and constitution are built firmly on British foundations. The capture of Quebec was one of the British Empire's greatest ever victories and shaped North America as we know it today. But it also led directly to Britain's most catastrophic defeat.